This is Bumping Into, where we have interesting conversations with people from all walks of life. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. I am Francis Populin, and in this episode, we'll be exploring the controversial theory that Adolf Hitler, one of the most notorious figures in history, escaped to Argentina after the end of World War II. According to this theory, Hitler and several other high-ranking Nazi officials fled Germany and settled in South America, where, for the most part, they lived out the rest of their lives in autonomy. While there's no denying that many high-ranking Nazi officials did settle in Argentina and surrounding countries, the theory about Hitler being one of them has been the subject of much debate and speculation over the years, with some historians flat out dismissing it as a conspiracy theory, while others arguing that there is an overwhelming and compelling evidence to support it. In this episode, we'll dive into the details of that theory, we'll examine the evidence that's been put forward, and we'll explore the possible reasons why and how Hitler could have chosen to flee to Argentina. All of this is going to be with researcher and author who has been credited with uncovering a lot of this evidence back in the 1980s, Harry Cooper. I was fortunate enough to spend several hours with Harry and go right into some of the evidence and theories that have really captivated me, and we talk extensively about his research and interviews into Hitler's escape uh, that is now extended decades in the making with people who claim they were there when this happened. So sit back and let's explore this fascinating topic together with Harry Cooper. G'day, mate. Hey, Harry, how are you going? I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Francis? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for um, making the time and agreeing to have a chat. My pleasure. So, so Harry, I, I would love to, um, before we go into, obviously, what everyone uh, knows you about, um, I would love to go backwards to to how you got interested in this, how it all came about, the, the Harry before the, the books and the fame. <laughs> oh boy way back a million years ago um i'm just a normal normal guy i was uh climbing the ladder in the executive world i was also driving uh, race cars on the super speedways um texas world speedway michigan uh pocono and uh one day, uh, everything went upside down. The uh, the engine in my race car blew. I was in the lead group with A.J. Foyt, Bobby Unzer, Al Unzer, and I blew the engine. That was at Texas. On my way home to Chicago, I blew the engine in my transporter truck. I was a good driver. I wasn't a very good, good engine builder, apparently. Um uh, <laughs> I got back to where I worked and my boss had quit for another company and a guy that I couldn't get along with was suddenly my boss. So I said to hell with it, sold everything I owned, bought a 30 foot sailing yacht, put an ad in a cruising world magazine for female crew slash companion <laughs> for a trip to the Bahamas. I got over 200 replies. Wow. And I answered them all by letter because there was no email at that time. Just 1979. Wow. And I sent a picture of me, a picture of the boat, and an outline of where we were going down to the Caribbean. And I said, there's two things that are absolutely firm. One, if you do drugs, don't bother answering this letter. Two, if you think you're going to sleep alone, don't bother answering this letter. <laughs> <laughs> got over 150 back. That's and, pretty good. Um, That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was in the 70s, man. You had to be there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was kind of open relationships. So I left Chicago in September 1979 with a blonde, a brunette, and a redhead. They were 24, 24, and 25 years old, and I was 40. Wow. Sail yeah, it was nice. They were all good cooks. <laughs> and uh, sailed on down to the Bahamas. Just living a beautiful life, swimming, crystal clear water, warm like your bathtub, 
friendly people there in the islands, just having a just a superb time. I ran across an island called Darby Island in the southern Exuma, and the ruins of a mansion were on the hilltop. And uh, so I asked the old caretaker, uh, what's that all about? And he says, oh, you don't know, Mom, this, this uh, was a plantation in the war years, and uh, we gave fresh water and food to German U-boats. And my first thought, of course, was uh, those damn Nazis. That's what we were taught. That's what everybody was taught. If you were German, you were a Nazi back in them days. So uh, he showed me where to chop on through the brush, and I found the remains of the barracks building and the radio shack. I took pictures, and but I had three more important things on my mind. Debbie, Lynette, and uh, what the hell was the other one? Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so we kept on, um, and one by one they went home, and another one would come out and take their place, etc. Finally, one day I reached in my wallet. I had $5 left. So I sailed back to Florida, put my boat in a marina, hitchhiked. Here I was, former vice president of a company, hitchhiking of Highway 1. Reached a room from my sister, got a job, went back to work as a corporate executive, and I started to research. And I found that these guys were not the horrible people we've been taught they were. Uh, you have, have to tell your men that the guy on the other side of the battlefield loves his country like you love yours. He has a wife and kids that he wants to get home to. He goes to the same church you go to. Now go kill him. People yeah. would maybe say, wait, let's rethink this. So you have to paint a picture uh, of horrible. Uh, in World War I, for instance, they said that the uh, U-boaters would rape young women to death and fire their lifeless bodies out the torpedo tubes. Nobody bothered to stop and ask, where do you find young women out in the middle of the ocean? So it, it, the propaganda is a necessary weapon. Yeah. But after the war is over, you got to let it go, and you have to be historically accurate. I'm a fanatic about accuracy and the truth. So that's how I started Shark Hunters. I found that the German U-boats had the highest loss rate of any military group ever in history. As a comparison, the United States Navy Submarine Service had the worst attrition rate for American forces. One man out of seven got killed. That's a terrible oh. loss ratio. On the German U-boats, it was the opposite. One man out of seven came home. Oh, and as I point out to uh, our members, um, in the magazine we produce and also the books. These are not just names on a roster of the guys who were killed. Uh, and I put a little more of my own in there. I, I put a picture of my 20-year-old son because he never made it to 21 years old. He was killed when he was 20. And so I point out these are not names on a roster. These are young men who are not coming home they're not going to be sitting at the Christmas dinner table. They're not going to be coming back to their yeah. mom and dad. There's tragedy everywhere. Nobody wins a war. No, that's um, right. So that's that's and, and, and I just thought it was absolutely wrong that history should treat them as evil monsters, machine gunning people in the water for sport, which was nice propaganda, but it's never been. It, it was not true. So I, I started shark hunters. We're in our 40th year now wow. february of 1983 i sent out our first newsletter it was one page it went to six people <laughs> we're now up uh we've issued member number 8700 of course wow. minus two or three thousand passed on but we were i was so fortunate that I got to meet all these great guys, yeah. all the warriors, not only the Germans, the Americans as well, the Brits. Um, so the research we do here, what we did, doesn't come from somebody else's book in a library. It comes from sitting down with these guys. I've been to Germany and Austria 
twice a year, every year, since 1988, until the Kong flu virus came along and we couldn't travel. But Otto Kretschmer, the top submarine commander of the war, I had a sleeping room in his home. He and his wife considered me family. Um, wow. Erich Topp, Reinhard Hardegg, and uh, I've been to their homes I don't know how many times when, when they were still with us. Hans Georg Hess, the youngest combat submarine commander probably ever in history, 21-year-old kid commanding a submarine. Um, he was my best friend in Germany. So wow. what I learned is these people aren't any different than you and me. They uh, lost the war and they were painted very badly by propaganda. Yes. Sorry to ramble on, but no. you have the background. No. No, 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 uh, absolutely. I, I, that's the bit that, you know, that's the, the attention to detail that interests me the most. And and to see that you're talking to the people, I mean, how often is it just, you know, well, this is what happened, don't question it, let's just run with it. But you've got this insight. You're fortunate that you came in at obviously the tail end of these people's lives and managed to talk directly to them, a time and an experience that can't ever happen again. They're absolutely correct. There are websites that came along. Incidentally, if you want to pass on to your listeners, sharkhunters.com is our website. Um, sharkhunters at sharkhunters.com is our email address. When you go to the website, you'll be, you'll be prompted to look at the Southern Poverty Law Center website. You probably don't know who they are over there in Australia, but. No. They're a bunch of left-wing do-gooders that uh, point the fingers at all sorts of people to keep the money rolling into their place. And they have posted on their website that I'm a Nazi. Oh, That's an absolute okay. lie. And I tell them, I, yeah. I say it on my radio programs, I say it in print that they're liars. And I dare them to sue me. And they haven't. So anyhow, sharkhunters.com, we have tons of books um, and People may become members of Shark Hunters and get our magazine. It costs a whopping five dollars, five dollars <laughs> a month. I don't, I don't know what that translates to uh, Oz oh. dollars. What's what's oh, your probably rate seven? Of it would probably be maybe seven dollars, something like that, Australian. Yeah, seven, maybe eight, or seven. Say seven dollars fifty, I guess. Okay. At any rate, uh, anybody who wants, send an email to me at Shark Hunters at SharkHunters dot com. And uh, we'll put you on the free Hotmail news list. That's not our magazine, but that's our Hotmail. Uh, we have all sorts of stuff on there. Our 55th book is going to the publisher on Monday. Wow, 55th. So there's still a yes, lot sir. of information that you're uncovering and being able to bring out. I mean, 55 books in. Yeah, not, not only U-Boat history. Now, in our books on on these histories, the U-boat history and the the new ones were coming out, Hidden Secrets um, of World War II, we had a lot of members who were spooks, guys who were agents, right. spies, also um, heavy, heavy researchers, honest researchers. And they gave me a lot of information and said I couldn't release it for 25 years. Well, that was 27 years ago and we're putting it into books now too wow. but the books about the u-boaters and about the the fly boys uh Luftwaffe, et etc it's not a story that runs through the whole book from page one to the page whatever each chapter is a separate standalone memory of a different veteran combat veteran mostly you u-boaters yeah. uh we've even had some uh we've we had one Victoria Cross winner as a member, uh, Tommy Gould, uh, Medal of Honor, American winners, et cetera. So everybody, Ronald Reagan was a member of Shark Hunters. Wow. Jeez, okay. That's incredible. And over the years, we've published all these stories in our magazine, a monthly magazine, so they're all in, they're all saved on the computer. So it's easy to put a book together. Now you just copy and paste, copy and paste, slug in photos, yep. and away you go. That's and nobody can match it now because these men have all gone on their final patrol. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's I mean the 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 detail and the insight that you've obviously obtained is it's invaluable to to the the true message of history, I guess. Exactly. And as I say, I'm a fanatic for accuracy and I hate lies and I hate yeah. propaganda. Yeah, it's uh, um for instance if you ever saw any of the movies of the uh, uh, United States uh, Marines in uh, taking the beachheads, et cetera, on Okinawa, women were throwing their children off cliffs into the sea and jumping off after them because their propaganda people said that U.S. Marines would cook and eat their babies. And that's why they were throwing them off the cliff. And, and it just propaganda, but they believed it. It's a very powerful tool, isn't it? The the propaganda wheel, and it's um, it's yeah. it, that, unfortunately it never gets old. It just it rebadges the new logo on the front and a new purpose, and off it goes again for various things. And it, the cycle continues on on different right. levels. But yeah, it doesn't go away. And unfortunately, so many people are sheeple. Yep, they believe what they're told just because they were told it. Yeah, and I did. I was, I was a dumbass. I was a sheeple. I believed all Germans were Nazis and uh, they machine gun people in, in the water for sport and, and they made lampshades out of people's skin. And that's just not true. None of it was true. But it got people down to the recruiting office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, The the thing that it interests me, so I tried, I I discovered this topic uh, on based on your your work, so that was my I guess going in in deep was through some of the work you've done, and it was interesting. I tried to it it got me intrigued, incredibly intrigued. Like I'm fascinated by it, and I thought I'm going to try and do a fifty fifty split. I'm going to go the the mainstream narrative and and look at all that and and watch those documentaries and read those books. And then I'm going to try and jump onto this side. And what's interesting is that when you go down the mainstream narrative, they're now starting to dislike being labeled mainstream. And it's almost like they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're saying this, oh, well, people are saying that we're mainstream as if it's wrong. And, and it's like, well, hang on a minute. Anyone that questions the narrative, even questions it, peeks around the corner, doesn't protest and jump and up and down and scream from the rooftops. But anyone that wants to question a narrative gets labeled a conspiracy theorist. So it's interesting now that you've got right. this use of terms on both sides of the fence that people can take offense to. And it's like, well, you know, it, there should be nothing wrong with sticking down the middle and trying to objectively look at both sides of the fence before you make your mind up. Right. And 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 the, the label conspiracy theorist is supposed to have a negative con connotation, but yeah. it is a real term. Yeah. If you have a theory that there's a conspiracy, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and, and they say that I'm a conspiracy theorist. What? What's the theory? I laid it out in hard fact. There's no theory to anything yeah. I write. I don't write anything that's a theory. It's hard fact, or I don't do it. Yeah. Right, because yeah. there are so many people. Well, our book, my, my best-selling book, entitled Hitler in Argentina, yep. in which I prove absolutely, there's no question, he lived out his life in South America, he and Ava Brown. Yep. Uh, about two years after my book came out, two other individuals didn't know each other, I guess. They came out with their own book, and it reads an awful lot. Like my book, I I won't use the word plagiarism, but doggone. And so many of these so-called authors, researchers, whatever, they do all their research in the library. Yeah. They find a whole bunch of books with the same topic, pull whatever they need from those books. And it gets to be it gets to be pretzel uh, research. Uh, yeah. Francis writes a book. Here he reads his book and thinks, I got a better idea and writes a book. And then Joe Schmo reads my book and does his own book. And then Francis reads that guy's book and does another book. It's circular logic and it doesn't go any. It's not worth a damn. First yeah. person, you can't refute it. I was about to say, how often do you not hear of someone saying, 
I just turned up and asked them. It's always, oh, this this was done, this was said, whispers and whispers based on what was said 30 years ago, so it must be true. And it's like, but hang on yeah. a minute, I just turned up and I spoke to the people that were there and I got it confirmed on 20 accounts uh, or, you know, whatever it may be. And then right. you sort of go, the, the weight that that carries is just, you know, so much stronger. Yeah, unfortunately, um Well, Eric Topp, for instance, the third most successful submarine commander. I've been in his home, I don't know how many times over there in Germany. He's come over here a couple of times. Um, Some numb nuts, I hope you don't mind me saying that. No, you can say anything you like. (laughs) Some numb nuts wrote a book and said that when Topp was patrolling off the east coast of the United States, he machine gunned people in the water. And a Coast Guard admiral wrote to that publisher and lit him up something fierce. He said that didn't happen. And then Eric Topp was a NATO admiral after the war. If he had machine gun people in the water, he'd have been on trial, not in command of anything. The three biggest lies of World War II are contained in one sentence. Adolf Hitler started World War II to kill all the Jews and rule the world. Well, first off, Hitler didn't start the war. If you dig into it, you'll find the Polish started the war by massacring ethnic Germans in August of 39. 49,000 of them were massacred. So he didn't start the war. Secondly, kill all the Jews. I had a good friend, Helmut Schmuckel. Doesn't get much more Jewish than Helmut Schmuckel. He was commander of U-802. He was commander of a German U-boat, and he was Jewish. There was a guy named Helmut Rosenbaum. That's really Jewish. He commanded U-29, and he sank, uh, I think it was HMS Courageous, an aircraft carrier. I've been in cemeteries in Germany where everyone in the cemetery is Jewish, a soldier who died fighting for Germany. That Um, opens up a whole other can of worms. Well... Did, what I would love to do with yourself is I would love to go into the um, uh, com- comparing some of the narratives and, and the, the story we've been told and weighing the evidence because, you know, there's lots and lots of strands of evidence and there's far more strands on one side of the fence than there is the other. So I want to go through what I've compiled as a rough summary. This is by no means a, you know, a, um, a detailed scientific summary, but this is just a, a rough summary of events and go through them with yourself and, and, and confirm those, those processes. And, and because that then leads into the alternative view, if, if that's what we want to call it. Um, okay. So we've got April 30, 1945, uh, Hitler's in the bunker and, you know, it's believed that he, he he poisons his well, his wife is poisoned and he shoots himself. His own his own staff then find him. They drag him, they drag both of them out, cover them in petrol, set them alight. The Soviets turn up and his staff basically are pointing back. There, there he is. That's who you've been looking for. That's he's over in that corner, and we've taken the liberty of burning the bodies and cremating them halfway through it. That that's that's him there. So the the body was at the time said to have been so badly burnt that they couldn't clearly identify it. So the conclusion was based on statements of his own staff. So his most loyalist staff that were in the building was, was based on that. And then they did, uh, I think they interviewed his dentist as well to confirm that, yep, that's, that's him. We're happy to say that's him. So effectively it was his own staff that were confirming that that was him. So we then have Stalin who's, who's unsure and says, I think he got away, but okay, let's just run down this path for a little bit. Um, there was a British intelligence officer that was sent over to to try and confirm the story, and he said that it's a mess. I can't, I can't confirm it, but ultimately, let's just say that he did die. Is that pretty much how you would say those events unfolded in a very thirty second summary? That's pretty much the way the uh, manufactured history has it. Um, it all says that Hitler shot himself in the right temple. Yeah. Okay. There's a picture of dead Hitler laying there. He's got a bullet hole in his forehead. That ain't the right temple. That was his cousin, Joseph Sillip, who looked like Hitler and even had the same 
Austrian accent. We go into this in great depth in some of my books. The three staff who confirmed it was Kempke, who was in charge of the motor pool and, and Hitler's driver, Linga, who was his uh, valet, and Guncha, who we know, who was his adjutant. And they were interrogated by the Soviets. And you can read into that, whatever you think interrogated means. And they all said, yeah, he, he did. Two of them said that, now they went into the room at different times, not at the same time. Two of them said that Hitler was seated next to Eva Brown and that Eva Brown's dress was wet because Hitler apparently had knocked over a flower vase. Uh, the third guy said Hitler was sitting on a chair facing the sofa. Now, that's a pretty fair size mistake. It, did he have his collar buttoned or not? That Who knows? But was he sitting on the sofa or was he sitting over here? Was Eva Brown sitting next to him on the sofa or was she laying down on the sofa? Um, I've cleared it with German spies and with American spies. They know he got away. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our members was a guy named Erich Pribke, who was a Hauptsturmfuhrer, captain of the SS. And he was living in San Carlos de Bariloche, which is 700 miles south of Buenos Aires. And he was one of Hitler's personal guards. In Argentina, another one of our members, the guy who blew the whole story, uh, uh, Don Angel Alcazar de Velasco, he was in the bunker for three months before the end of the war. He made a daily report to Hitler, so he knew, you know, it was very familiar. He saw Hitler and Eva Brown forcibly drugged under orders of Martin Bormann and removed from the bunker. And he met with Hitler in 1952 down near San Carlos de Bariloche, much closer to a little town called Vicha Langostura. I've been to that estate 11 times where Hitler lived for 10 years after the war. Last time I was there, we spent the night. Uh, wow. My group, I brought a group down there. Not in the main house because it's, it's going to hell. It's been ignored. It's beautiful, beautiful old home, but... It's falling apart. We stayed in one of the guest houses. Um, I interviewed a lady down there who she and her husband saw Hitler, 1952, down there. The FBI, my book, Hitler in Argentina, has about 30 pages of FBI reports. They knew he was down there. They knew where he was. But middle 1947, Harry Truman told the FBI, break off. Don't look for him anymore. We think, we don't know for a fact, but we think that was the quid pro quo. Uh, we get all the German technology, scientists, et cetera, and we just leave Hitler alone. Operation Paperclip. Right. It led up to Paperclip. Yep. My career field in the Air Force was special weapons, which means hydrogen bombs. In 1958, I went into tech school, uh, January through July. Hard, hard school, because if you're working with hydrogen bombs, they like for you to know what you're doing. Uh, the first week of school, we saw the video. I'm sorry, the films. There was no video back then. We saw the films of the early U.S. atomic project. And we were having a terrible time. The Japanese test fired their first atom bomb a week before we test fired our first one. The Japanese ran out of fissionable material. We had very little left. The problem we were having was the triggering device. To get a nuclear explosion, you start with a ball of uranium, enriched uranium, about the size of a grapefruit, perfectly round, surrounded by 64 shaped charges, making a giant sphere. Every one of them 64 shaped charges has to detonate at exactly the same precise millisecond to crush in and create critical mass. If one goes off a millisecond too soon or too late, you got nothing but junk flying around. The, uh, the big German cargo submarine U-234 surrendered in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It had on board all sorts of high-tech stuff, a lot of high-ranking people. It also had 560 kilos of uranium. 
And it had a guy named Dr. Heinz Schlicker, who later became a member of Shark Hunters. But at that time, he was the world expert in anti-magnetic, magnetic suppression for submarines, and also infrared triggering devices. And he's the one who designed the triggers for our bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima, which is not pronounced Hiroshima, it's Hiroshima. And if you got American history over there in, in Australia, the, the Trinity project where they had a 300 foot tower out in the, the New Mexico desert and they put an atom bomb up there and they triggered it and they, were, they had built a small town a couple of miles away to see the damage. Dr. Schlicker was in charge of that whole project. Right. So there, there's so much more when you dig into yeah. Francis. I get a, I get to my desk at 4.30 in the morning and I'm still going, well, right now it's 7.30 here in America, in, in Florida, and I'll be going another hour or two after I get off the phone with you. Every day. So I do this. More. Yeah. And it's like peeling an onion. Yeah. You get an answer by peeling one skin off the onion and doggone, there's more under it. See, I wanted to also break down a few of these um, because when you do listen to the two sides, um, the 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 let's let's call them mainstream and 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 just use that as a blanket term and say, you know, they they brought out um, which I, I thought was quite comical um, in um, so first it was the skull I think two thousand and nine they said right. uh, the skull and then they said oh no actually that skull was is female DNA that's not Hitler's. So then, and a young they, female. yes, that's right. And, and then they, 2018, the media, uh, I mean, you can Google it and it comes up 100% conclusive that conspiracy theories are put to rest. We've, we've tested Hitler's teeth and we can confirm they're, they're his, um, because he was a vegan and the teeth that we found were a vegan. But when you go into the yeah. skull and the teeth, there seems to be a lot of gray as in no one can say why they were separated. So it it's they're, they're saying no, it's not from that skull. They were stored in separate locations. It's like, well, yeah, oh, okay. And then the argument, uh, which I thought was was quite interesting, and I was going to quiz you on this, is the argument they brought up, and they said, well, the alternative view is saying that um, they that one of the the ladies uh, was like a maid or a housekeeper. She would bring Hitler food in Argentina, and she said, "I used to bring him typical German food." And they turned around and said, "Well, the teeth that we uh, are saying only because they're vegan teeth, not because of DNA testing against family members, just that they're veg a vegan's teeth." And Hitler apparently was a vegan, so what yes, this was. lady is saying is wrong because she's saying she brought him sausages. And I thought this almost sounds like kids arguing. And I'd be interested to hear your view on that comment about them dismissing that maid's statement um, because she said she brought typical German food to him and them saying that these apparent teeth that were separate to the skull are a vegans. Yeah, let me step back. Uh, and when my book came out in the late 80s, it was well received. And I think certain people who are the keepers of this baloney uh, saw that it was gaining traction. That's when they came out with the bullet in the skull part. Wow. And that was dismissed as uh, false. And we started gaining traction again, more people believing that Hitler got away. Then they came out with the teeth. Oh, his dentist didn't have Hitler's records, dental records. They had been burned. But with the help and assistance of his Soviet captors, he remembered. Right. And so that, that's bogus, too. And I'll tell you what, so many people believe that the Russians got his body, which didn't happen. And I love it when they get carried away and get very wound up and they start yelling, they've got the body. And I, I ask them, who's got the body? And they, the Russians, they got the body. And I tell them, I'm an honorary Russian submarine officer. I've been all through the Kremlin. I've been all through the Red Army Museum. There ain't no body. If Stalin would have had Hitler's body, even if it was toasted like a marshmallow, it would have been on display in the Kremlin wall behind glass. Yeah. yeah. They don't have Hitler's body on display because they don't have Hitler's body. The guy died on the 13th of February, 1962 in Bolivia. Oops. It's, uh... <laughs> you know, the, 
people say, well, there, there are two sides to every story. No, there isn't. Two plus two equals four. There ain't no other side to it. Hitler yeah. did not die in the bunker. There's no other side to that story except people who are weak minded. And 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 look, I I would like to think that anyone that goes into it, um, if this, there's a few comments I, I'm going to bring up that that resonated with me from some other works on this area, and and it. Anyone that looked at the evidence uh, that didn't know the story, that didn't feel the weight, that had no back end to it, um, I don't think that the evidence that they're using to close the book on this would stand up in a current court case. It's just not enough. Where when you layer exactly. in all of the other side, and, and you know, I don't want to sound like I'm jumping on one side of the fence and screaming from the rooftops about it, but I, I'm, I, I just think that once you look at the other side, there is just so many strands that interconnect. And like you said, you peel one layer back and there's another, and then this ties yeah. into, it was, it was an inter, interwebbing effect that is so complex. And one of the things I was going to ask you about is some of these other bit, bodies of work that have come since, you know, you sort of broke ground on this um, is the, um, the documentary series that I think the history channel might've done called hunting Hitler. Um, oh God. Now I I I enjoy it for its uh information, but I, I find it oh, hard to watch gosh. because of the uh dramatization and hearing about oh, God, how yes. good everyone is and, and how What's the, behind this door? Tune in tomorrow. Exactly. We'll show you. I find that I find that brings the credibility down. But what I did take from it is one of the comments that I think FBI, CIA, one of the guys there that that repeatedly would tell you how many times he's done this and how successful he is at it. Um, he hmm. made a comment that resonated with me and he said, if Hitler had a life insurance policy, they wouldn't have paid out based on the evidence that they've got that he died. That he was quoting uh, one of the American generals during the uh, conference in uh, Potsdam, I think it was on the oh. weight of uh, current uh, evidence or whatever. There's no insurance company in America that would pay a claim on Adolf Hitler. We have yeah. photos of him drinking tea in 1947. He looked good for a guy that was dead for two years. <laughs> he must was have been in... green tea. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, you know, he always used to say, tea is schön, coffee is gift. Tea is sweet, coffee is poison. He was a hardcore vegan. He did some great things. Uh, do you know what vivisection is? No. Okay, tying down an animal and cutting them open to see how the parts work with no anesthesia. And it's just brutal. He was the first world leader to outlaw vivisection. Oh, wow. Okay. That's it. That's interesting. I, yeah. I wouldn't have thought that based on the reputation for him being quite the, you know, being extremely brutal. Uh, I tell people there's there's really two Hitlers, the real one and the one that history tells you about. Wow. And I don't want anybody to start going after me for that comment. I'm a historian. Was Hitler a good guy or a bad guy? I don't give a damn. I care about where he was, when he was there. And that's it. Who did what, with which, to whom, good, bad, or otherwise? I don't care. Make your own decision on that. But yeah, here's I'm what you found. Yeah, yeah. Well, and ultimately, it's the, what what you're. Even if you had an opinion, it's an opinion. It's it's that's you know, right. there's nothing to to be worried about um, for other people to jump up and down about that. Um, but is there any? Is there any breakdown as far as you're aware about the housekeeper that said she used to bring him the food and him being a vegan? Is, is this a lost in translation that she was saying she brought him? It could have been. Uh, her name was uh, Catalina Gamara. Right. And she served him during that time when he was drinking the tea down there with the Eichhorn family. I never heard that she served him sausage because he wouldn't have been eating sausage. But, um, I don't know what she said, but I know she did say that she uh, waited on him down there. Yeah, There's yeah. a hotel in the little town of La Falda, which is up in uh, Cordova province, which was a going concern way before the war. And the Eichhorn family bought it in 1917, 18, or something like that. Eichhorn is the German word for acorn. They were very staunch supporters of Hitler and 
Walter Eichhorn's wife, Ida, sent a lot of money to Hitler when he was coming up in the political world. This hotel, and I've been there several times, is out in the middle of nowhere, 400 miles northwest of Buenos Aires. It's a big, beautiful hotel by old standards. And people didn't come there for a weekend or a week. They came there for an entire season because it was away from everything. And uh, it was the only place for hundreds of miles around that could pick up radio reception. And I have pictures of hundreds of people sitting in the courtyard with the big loudspeakers overhead, and they were broadcasting Hitler's speeches to the crowd, which was mostly German expats down there. Uh, and the hotel is now closed because it was seized by the government right after the war. It's closed except for a little museum tour, but on the same grounds, there's the annex, which is where Hitler was having tea with the Eichhorn family, and it is still open as a bed and breakfast, and I stayed there last time I was down there. Old-fashioned place with the big cloth-footed bathtubs and 16-foot-high ceilings with 12-foot-high double oak doors. Just a fantastic place. And they all know that he stayed there. Wow. He's, you look puzzled. Well, I, I'm just fascinated. It just it's so intriguing. It's it's absolutely it's it's gripped me, the story. Um I mean I've always liked history, but just the the complexity of this one and the the significance of it and and like the layers. There's just so much. There's just so much yeah. weight on this side that uh, like you said, it's you can explore for years. And do you, do you believe um, there's the theory that uh, he went from, uh, was it a day or two days before he was said to have died, that his pilot flew him to Spain and then he U-boated to Argentina? Is that in line with what you've found? No, absolutely not correct. That was in uh, those two books that came along, they copied, I'm sorry, uh, that look a lot like my book. <laughs> and they used one of those books for that hunting Hitler farce. Hitler was incredibly claustrophobic and he got seasick looking at a bowl of soup, more or less. Uh, he was seen in the bunker on his birthday, the 20th of April. At that, on that day, U530, the boat that these clowns say he was on, was already three days out to sea. So how did he get aboard the boat if it was three days out to sea? That boat was on a combat mission. The skipper, Otto Wehrmuth, was a member of Shark Hunters. We had many conversations. He swore on uh, on his honor as an officer and a gentleman. He had no passengers aboard. They were on a combat mission. They went to New York. They fired at some ships. Fortunately, they missed. Then they got word that the war was over and they should surrender. Um they didn't want to go into prisoner camp, <clears throat> and some of the crew had relatives in Chile. So they decided they were going to go down around Cape Horn and go to Chile, where they could surrender or just come ashore and not have any trouble. Yeah. They got down way south of Punta Mogades, and they ran into such heavy weather, they used up way too much fuel. So they turned around and came back to Mar del Plata, uh, which is the, one of the big bases there in Argentina, and they surrendered there. Uh, and uh, eight days later, another German U-boat came in and surrendered at the same place. Uh, that, I was told by Otto Wehrmuth, the skipper of 530, that was the best camouflage for Hitler coming down there because they took him out there was a, a Blumenvoss BV-138 flying boat that landed on uh, Wannsee, right out in, in Berlin. Took some people on board, we don't know who. And they flew up to Norway, which was the only place Germany was still in total control. We're not sure he was on that plane, but we are sure that he was there in Norway. He got on board one of uh, the only one of three gigantic airplanes that Germany had, the Ju-390. They had three of them, named V-1, V-2, and V-3, which had nothing to do with the V-weapons. 
That's just our name. V3 never got finished. V2 was, or V1 was destroyed. V2 was three meters longer than V1, so it had more fuel capacity. And it flew all the way. They painted it in Swedish Air Force blue. And they flew all the way down and landed uh, on an estancia in Uruguay outside the town of Paisandu. And one of our one of our people, agents, we call them SEIG agents, S-E-I-G, Shark Hunters, Eagle Hunters, Intelligence Group. He got a hand-drawn chart from the files. And I went down there. And it was exactly like the chart showed, including the, the little wooded area where they put the uh, radio direction finder so the plane could find its way in. It landed. This is a big six engine plane the size of a 757. It landed there in Uruguay. And we went to the little villages around there. The, most of the men had died off. The, the widows were still there, very old. <clears throat> They all remembered here in the plane land that night. And so we went to talk to the daughter of the owner of the Estancia, who wasn't even alive at that time. She was born three years later. And I always uh, start out uh, my interview with nice, easy questions to take the jitters away. And then I bingo. So then I said, uh, what about the, the big plane that landed in the middle of the night on such and such date, she and her husband both looked at each other. And we got that little tee hee hee tee hee, that nervous laugh. And and the lady said, "Well, that that never happened." I said, "Well, all these other people said they heard the plane land." She said, "Well, yeah, somebody reported it, and the prefect of police, which is the highest cop in the area, came to investigate, but he found it was only a crop." duster airplane. I said, crop dusters don't have instruments. They don't fly at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So we found out later what happened to that plane. It moved on down without him, moved on down to Paraguay, where it was in service until 1960 something. Um, and Hitler then was moved to the Estancia San Ramon, which is near Bariloche, because the, the rail lines went that far. And that's as far as the rail lines went. This was in July of uh, 45, which was the dead of winter down there. So they couldn't go anywhere. So they stayed for a few months at the Estancia San Ramon. I was there in 2008 and went to the uh, manager of the Estancia, a very nice young man. Yeah, he was in his 40s. To me, that's young. Um, well, that's good because that's me too. <laughs> there you go. Uh, he uh, he spoke excellent English with a German accent. He spoke excellent Spanish with a German accent. And I was asking all the nice, light questions. And he was very polite, answered all the questions. And there was the main house. And then there was a bunch of guest houses. So uh, uh, I, I got to that point and then I, I swept my hand toward all the guest cottages. And I said, uh, which was the guest cottage that Hitler and Eva Brown stayed in when they came here in 1945? The obvious answer, you'd think, the guy would say, hey, I'm only 40 years old. I wasn't even around back then. Yeah. No, he said, I have been instructed. I must not speak about that time. Red flags. So. <laughs> and that's that's in 2008. That's so long after this has ha all happened. Exactly. And that Estancia was owned by a, a German uh, nobleman. Most of Argentina was owned by Germans and some by Italians. Um, I have a friend there, Eduardo, and a couple of years ago, I was talking to him. He, he's a retired lieutenant commander from the Argentine Navy and a surgeon, retired surgeon. I said, Eduardo, I said, what the heck? I, I'm not seeing very many Hispanic looking people here. And he laughed. He said, that's because. Most of Argentina, 85% is from Western European stock. And then I found until 1960s or 70s, I think, the Argentine constitution said only people from Western Europe could emigrate into Argentina. 
Yeah, you learn these things when that's all you do, 16 hours yeah, a day. Yeah, yeah. My wife yeah. keeps saying I should retire. What? And do what? Play and golf? Do, yeah. I did that once. <laughs> I thought that was the biggest waste of a morning I ever put in. <laughs> of course, back in those days, I was spending Sunday afternoons at 180 miles an hour on the super speedway. So playing golf was kind of lame. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to quiz you on another documentary i think you could call it a documentary um the the gray wolf series or movie um what because what i found interesting is that the hunting hitler paints a picture um you know very very strong evidence that he definitely got out that he fled but it paints this picture that he was underground on the run there was uh structures found deep buried in the jungle you know and and he he did time there and that they were built like military defense bases and you know they show you all these buildings and they're you know fascinating to watch but the picture is that he was very much this frantic underground pace of moving his way through the place to avoid detection but then when you watch the, the gray wolf one that paints more of a picture of he fled and was so well protected and and um, highly regarded that he could just exist in quite calmness uh, above ground. Do, yeah. do you see it's, that it's contrast? Of, yeah, it's uh, an idiotic contrast. He was never underground. He was never running. I've been to Inalco many. I've been eleven times. There ain't no underground there. Uh, and he was incredibly well protected because Juan Perón was their protector. And he was, Juan Perón was getting paid tons of money. And unlike later on when Perón was kicked out and the Mossad came in and grabbed Eichmann, who was not a very Im important figure, he didn't have the protection. Um, he was working on the production line at Mercedes of Argentina. He rode the bus three hours each way to work and back. So he was not well protected. Yeah. To get to Hitler, it would have required a military invasion, yeah. literally, because he was so well protected. And the Argentine military, well, I've got pictures of them. You'd think you were looking at military maneuvers in Munich. These guys were all wearing German uniforms. They had all German equipment. They were all German trained. What what is that relationship? I mean, how how was where does that stem back to that there was this a staunch connection between the two Argentina's you know uh, and and Germany to allow this to all happen so seamlessly? I mean, what what where does that stem from? Is it a First World War thing, or does it go back further into families that have have further? Come in? Wow, further okay. you 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 touched on a, a very critical point. Our second book, Hitler and the Secret Alliance, covers that. Right. In about 1905, 06 or something like that, Argentina wanted to develop quickly. So they were giving huge, huge tracts of land to primarily Germans, some Italians, but primarily Germans. That had and, money. Uh, yeah. The prince families, the duke, whatever, uh, ship, uh, Schomburg, Lippa, etc. And in those days, even before the First World War, some guy would have this gigantic cattle spread down there, and there were pesky uh, Indians down there, native uh, Argentinians. I forget what they were called, but they were Aborigines. Okay. They never had a war. They just called the army under uh, General Rojas. They'd go to the village, kill all the Indians, and the problem solved. So by the time World War I came along, Germany was well entrenched in Argentina, they had farms all over the place. So by the time World War II collapsed, they could just slide right in. Um, some, like Hitler, did not come in the front door. Uh, Bormann, Mangala, they all came in surreptitiously. But the average Germans were coming in on ships. There was a an autobahn, if you want to call it, from Spain, from Italy, down the center of the United of the of the Atlantic on the 30th, what is that, Latin, longitude, whatever, straight down, and there was a sort of secret island called Trindade, not to be confused with Trinidad, Trindade, which is a rock in the middle of the South Central Atlantic, um, about two and a half miles long by a mile or so wide, and 
it rises up to 3,000 feet very quickly. Everything is up and down on that island. And um, it belonged to Brazil. It has belonged to Brazil forever. They kept like 30 or so people on the island all the time to raise the flag in the morning and show they owned 200 miles of fishing around there and nobody could go in there and then pull the flag down at night. 1938, they took all their people off the island. And a week later, there was a German scientific fleet came in and they didn't get there in one week from Germany. It was planned. Um, they built radio towers. They built buildings. Then they went on down to Antarctica and mapped out Neue Schwabenland, which is another whole mystery. But then in 41, 1941, the Germans left. The Brazilians put their people back and there's a, a, a stone plaque that somebody made that says 1941. Then the war ended May of 45. In July of 45, a large German contingent arrived on the island because the Brazilians had just left and they started it was kind of like a, a supermarket because they had large flocks of pigs, large flocks of goats and sea turtles and there was fresh water all over the island, uh, streams, creeks, pools, ponds. And I'm not saying this from what I read. I was there. Yeah. I walked all over. They, they gave me free reign. The Brazilian Navy was so super. They told me I could go any place I wanted. This was like maybe wow. 10 years ago. Yeah, 10 years ago. And I went all over. Uh, there's photos all over my website. But every place I went, there was this young guy walking along with me. So I finally, after a couple of days, I asked the captain who was my host, I said, how come this guy's with me? Are you afraid I'm going to steal your island? He says, no, you're an older man and he's the, the doctor here. And if you have a heart attack, we wanted him right with you. <laughs> so, uh, but I was there, I filmed and there's, there's a rock where somebody painted on it, 7 slash 17, which was the date a German sailor was killed in a, in a shipboard accident there. And the Germans were there for years, some years after the Brazil, after the end of the war, the Brazilians left, then the Germans left, the Brazilians came back. And that's how they were able to slide right on down into uh, Buenos Aires. And with, and they all had, I can't say all, but the Vatican was helping. Yeah. That's why you find so many men, uh, people down there in, in Argentina with the last name Kirchner, which means oh. church man. And the Vatican is re still refusing to this day to release any um, documents surrounding that period of time. Why should they? Yeah. <laughs> it would be nice if they would, but why should they? Yeah. What's in it for them other yeah. than a lot of grief? Yeah, true, true. It, do, do you think, so if we go to the town of, um, is it, Bar Barilocci, Bar is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, Barilocci. Barilocci. So, obviously, that's that became a huge influx of of Germans and Nazis all went there, and it turned into a you know a, a mini a community of 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 their own type. It, it's a very large place now. I think it's about one hundred fifty thousand people. It's a huge tourist place. Right. Okay. So. There was, I, I came across a video of a guy, he's a traveler, and he goes anywhere and everywhere. This isn't specific to this course of history, but he ended up finding the house where Eric, is it um, Pre... Prebke. Prebke. Eric Prebke. Eric lived. Prebke. Yeah. So he found his place, and his son's wife still lives there. And he was yeah. speaking to her, and she seems like a lovely lady, you know, very typical of a of a grandmother type figure. And um, she made the comment, which I thought was interesting, because she said, "Oh, all, all the Germans are gone. Um, you know, it's 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 <laughs> not like it used to be. They're they're either dead or they've gone back, and this and this and that." And I thought, "Oh, that doesn't seem right." Um, is that is how do you feel about that place? Is it still very much like there is? It is of what it was. I had dinner with Eric Priebke's uh, son some years ago. Right. Incredibly intelligent man. He sat at the head of the table. I was on his right, and there were two Germans on my right. But on his left was an Argentine guy. He was carrying on a conversation with Mahuel in Argentine Spanish, which is uh, a little different. 
carrying on a conversation with the two Germans in German, carrying on a conversation with me in English all at the same time. Wow. Very intelligent man. And uh, his father, this his father came there and founded the German school, which is now a huge university there, founded the German Argentine Cultural Center, which is very big now, but you can't say his name anymore because, oh, God, no. 1995, Sam Donaldson, who was an American newsman, he looked like his hair was made out of fiberglass. He went down there, you know, typical jackass reporters. Yeah. He went down there. He was looking for a guy named uh, Mahler. I can't remember his first name. Mahler was uh, SS. And he got a hold of Mahler and was trying to interview him. And Mahler says, you don't want me. You want the big fish. There's Priebke over there. So he, he interviewed Priebke and outed him. Priebke got sent back to Rome to stand trial in a civilian court for war crimes. He wound up innocent. So he came back to Bariloche. And that wasn't good enough. Certain people didn't like that. So then he was brought back for a court-martial, a military court, and he was found guilty of war crimes. And the problem was uh, he was uh, stationed there in Rome, and some partisans killed 11 German soldiers. So according to whatever treaty was in effect, the Germans had the right to kill 10 civilians for every German soldier that was killed. So 11 soldiers killed they could kill 330. Primke wow. said, no, the war's almost over. I don't want any part of this. Hitler gave him a direct order. He had to. So he contacted the mayor and said, hey, you've got any criminals in your jail that are due to be executed? Let me take care of it. So they gave him a bunch of people, marched them up to the caves, shot them all. Turned out there was not 330. There was 333. So it was okay to kill 330 by the treaty. But it was the extra that got him. That's correct. So he was tried. uh, 1995, it started. And and when it's all settled down a few years later, he was 95 years old. He was convicted and sentenced to house arrest. (laughs) I wouldn't mind being in house arrest like he was. He was in a very palatial apartment in an upscale neighborhood in Rome. And his guards were beautiful young women, carabineries. I could live with that. Plus, we got photos of him shopping in the supermarket, walking in the park across the street. It was a hell of a pen of punishment, wasn't it? But anyhow, he never got to go back to Bariloche. His son lived there. And uh, at this dinner, we were talking. And all of a sudden, I forget how the point came up. But all of a sudden, he, his son blurted out, if it weren't for the Nazis, this town wouldn't even exist. I guess a lot of money went in there. Yeah. So in, in the second book, Hitler and the Secret Alliance, we show where all these big shots lived in Buenos Aires. We have photos of their home when they lived there in the 40s and 50s. And we have photos of the house now with the street address. There's pictures of Mengele sitting on the front porch with uh, a fellow named Malbrank, who was a friend of Perron's. Uh, Mengele, I think it was Mengele, had a mansion that was backyard to backyard with Juan Perron. They didn't live undercover, the big guys. They had so much money. Um, In 2008, my first time there, I went to the uh, Plaza Hotel, which was back in the day was the upscale hotel in South America. It's still ultra nice. So I went to the um, manager, nice lady, Senora Rodriguez, and I told her who I was and what I was doing there. And uh, I said, my records indicate that Martin Borman lived here in this hotel with two beautiful young ladies for two years after the war. And she never batted an eye. She said, Yeah, room uh, 740, the presidential suite. But I didn't know anything about the two young women, but that's where he lived for two years. Okay, they knew it. Yeah. So next time I go down there, uh, the the executive dining room has been closed for whatever reason for decades. 
but I have permission to go into the executive dining room, which is where Foreman ate, and take photos. It was it was well known down there. Borman and uh, Perron had joint checking account under their own name. Scorzini, the the great commando, Scorzini, six foot seven, the guy who rescued Mussolini. We saw pictures of him down there with Hans Ulrich Rudel, the greatest pilot probably ever, had only one leg. They were skiing in the Andes by Bariloche. Well, what's wrong with skiing in the Alps back in Bavaria? Well, we know why they were there. And something else that we're still trying to figure out why, uh, there's an a, there's a incredibly upscale resort called Shao Shao. It's spelled L-L-A-O dash L-L-A-O. But down there in their Castellano Spanish, it's pronounced Shao Shao. During his presidency, Dwight Eisenhower was down there at Shao Shao. During Jimmy Carter's presidency, he was there at Shao Shao. Or, uh, then during Clinton's presidency, he was there at Shao Shao. During Obama's presidency, he was there at Shao Shao. So they all and when, uh, Yeah, yeah. And uh, John Kerry, when he was Secretary of State, he was down there. There's lots of glamorous resorts all around the world. Why are they going to that one? We think we know, and we're tra tracing it down before we say anything, but we think we know why. Do, have you found, because uh, I'm curious if this has happened to you, so when you watch that, that Grey Wolf documentary, it ends with, uh, I think an author goes to some function and he's speaking to a lady and he asks for um, uh, access to some of the, is it the Oswald papers? Um, because he's working with someone that wants to make a movie about this story. That night, he gets a phone call threatening his life, saying, you need to drop this, this drop the story. Um, and then it, it alludes to the fact that Ava Brown was still alive um, and that, you know, people were looking after that interest and pressuring mm. people away. Have you ever felt any pressure? Has there ever been anyone that's, that's directly told you you need to stop, you know, stop barking up this tree. Not in that manner. Um, but because the Southern Poverty Law Center posted that I was a Nazi, which is a flat out lie, I was supposed to receive an honorary doctorate. That went out the door. Uh, I was a charter member of the International Press Club of Chicago. I got kicked out of that. I went to join the National Press Club, and on the phone they said, hey, your re your references are great. No problem. Two weeks later, I got a short little email saying, your membership is denied. No further contact. Um, but it's cost us a lot, of, a lot of members over the years because some people are just afraid. But that's interesting that, you know, you've been to Argentina many times and you've been Lemon. to these places and you've spoken to these people and, and no yeah. one's told you to back off. You, you know, you might uncover something that makes someone uncomfortable because even in that hunting Hitler, and I know it's a dramatization, they, yeah. they keep referring to. A lot to, of it came from my book. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the guys continually, when they're in these areas, uh, you know, Brazil or Argentina and, and Colombia, they're always saying it's been 75 years, but people here are still scared. You can see the fear in their eyes. They've, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to upset. It's as if there's something still present there that can come of, of them speaking. And you sort of go, well, you know, we're pushing on a long time ago now. You know, that just drama for right. them. Um, yeah. it, if I can say it, bullshit. That's what it was. <laughs> I, I I didn't watch that one. And the Grey Wolf thing, that was the book, Grey Wolf, The Hunt for Hitler. And they made the Hunting Hitler documentary from that. And then I guess the Grey Wolf came from that, too. I didn't watch it. Uh, but some of our members, they said this one guy who used to be a Navy SEAL was going to sneak onto the property. He comes roaring by at 40 miles an hour in a rubber boat, yeah. goes over the side and sneaks up on there yeah when i came by boat we just pull up and run it up onto the beach now we come by problem. car <laughs> no we uh i know the caretaker i knock on the door senor torres here's a picture of uh of benjamin franklin a hundred dollar bill he goes unlocks everything and says okay tell me when you're done <laughs>
it's a shame and I get it. The majority of people want to see drama and they buy it. I, I get yeah. it. Um, but that is interesting. And your theory on, um, you mentioned he died in, was it 1962? Is that when you, when you believe? 62, he 13th of June. Yeah. So where, where do you believe he died and what was the cause? Was it just old age? Yeah. Yeah. He was 75 and he had led a rough life. He, um, uh, let me step back one. Some of our members, some of our friends did die under strange circumstances. My best agent um, in Germany, uh, his father was killed in the U-boats, and he started an outfit called the uh, the Alpha History Task Force. They were digging up files like mad and sending them over to me. And one day he uh, he bumped his leg. He was a big man, looked like a football linebacker, 6'2", 240 pounds, Bumped his leg, got a bruise, went to the hospital, dead. Oh, he had sepsis. Oh, what a shame. Goodbye. Dead. And, you know, others I could name too, but, uh, really? so, you know. So there is a few unusual yeah. things that have happened. But, I mean, you've been you've been um, researching and, and speaking about this for years, and you've obviously, yeah. you know, uncovered things that make some people uncomfortable. Um, yeah. But do you, do you ever think... I mean, is there still stories to be told? Are there still families that wouldn't talk? That is there anything going on down there that may still be dark and hidden? I think I think, like I say, what they put on that show is drama and yeah. and baloney. I've talked to people down there; they are ready, they're willing to talk to me. Not a problem. I just I'm genuine with them. I tell them I'm a researcher. I'm not a Nazi hunter. I just want what's going on and they sit down the they talk to me uh, like i say i had dinner with Pripke's son other people down there the the last um uh chief of the argentine nuclear energy program uh, dr mariscotti he's a good friend of mine he tells me everything i know i need to know down there there's an island in that lake where hitler lived only on the other side um uh ho- well, whatever, I can't pronounce it. Anyhow, German scientists built a nuclear research laboratory there. They started two years after the war ended. Duh. Oh, yeah. So they, the Third Reich did not perish. They just moved. And and where, where um, is there any idea on where he may be buried, if he was buried and not cremated? How's the weather down there in Argentina? <laughs> <laughs> Let me get back to you asked about how he how he died. Okay, he was uh, there's a, a guy I know who was a young man, just a kid when the war ended. His father was high up in the army who disappeared. His mother took him. His mother was good friends with Eva Brown and also with Magda Goebbels. His mother took him and fled down to Bolivia where they had a sugar plantation, and the kid grew up down there. One time he got bucked off a horse, broke his arm, knocked himself out. When he was waking up, the doctor who was setting his arm was Mangala. So then in 1962, January, he said everybody on that plantation had to step out alongside the driveway because Hitler was coming. And he got out of the limousine in a wheelchair and because he was in rough shape, they wheeled him up there and everybody had to do the uh, so-called Nazi salute, which is in reality the, the Roman salute. Romans mm-hmm. greeted each other that the way with their arm out and their hand up to show they had no weapon. So anyhow, he went there to visit with the manager of that plantation, a guy named uh, Fritz Wiedemann, who was Hitler's commanding officer in World War I and was his adjutant in World War II. And so apparently there were documents or something that Fritz Wiedemann had there. Hitler visited with him for a couple of hours, and then he went back to where he was living in Bolivia. And uh, he died a month later, 13th of February, 1962. He was not cremated. Right. Something about 12 black marble pillars, 12 was very important to the Third Reich. 12 uh, 
uh, Knights of the Round Table, 12 Disciples of Christ. Uh, another thing that will probably shock people, Hitler was a practicing Catholic when he was young. I was in the church where he sang in a church choir. Wow, okay. So there's 12, 12 black marble pillars, 12 golden eagles on top, 40 tons of gold. And a wow. sarcophagus in between it. Wow, okay. So it's um it's there forever. Yeah. And and what about his wife? What what became of her? Because there was reports obviously that she lived to be well into her late nineties. Yeah, we we have evidence she was alive in two thousand two, which made her ninety years old at the time, which is not any big deal anymore because yeah. Hell, I'm knocking on the door of nine. I'm, I'm 83. I, be, I better live past 90. <laughs> um, and we think we have rumors, and that's all, that she made it to age 100, but no proof yet. And, and she was in a nursing home at that time, so we're told, but we have no proof on it. And is that still a line you're chasing? Is it something that you still... We're We're looking into it, yeah. Yeah. And what about the talk that he had a daughter? Uh, I know one of those uh, documentaries talks about, is it um, Ushi was her name? Ushi Hitler? Mm, yeah. Allegedly, supposedly, and I think actually the daughter of uh, her sister, I think her sister's name was Gretel. And there's a picture of Ushi with, uh, with Hitler and Eva Braun in, in Germany before the end of the war. Uh, there are skeletons in everybody's closet there. Um, they think certain people think that was their daughter. Uh, I've seen no evidence whatsoever to show that it, she was anything other than Gretel's child. Um, also, this guy, Don Angel Alcazar de Velasco, the guy who was in the bunker and saw Hitler removed. Uh, he stayed working for the Reich. He moved to Mexico City, and uh, in 1952, he was ordered to fly south, which he did, and he met with Hitler. He was ordered to keep track of two children in uh, the hell, Las Cruces, New Mexico schools, a boy named Adolfo and a girl named Stern, which is the German word for star. So in 1952, he was ordered to get the file and go south, which he, he did. He said he landed in Antarctica, but I think that was smoke and mirrors because he described it. And it's exactly the compound at Bariloche. Uh, <clears throat> right. And he gave the um, he met with Hitler in 52 and he gave the files and the photos of these two children to Hitler. And that was it. Then he went back up to Mexico City. Who were these two children? We don't know. People say, oh, it must have been Hitler and Eva Brown's two children. Maybe they were, but they don't know. We don't know. It might have been illegitimate kids from John F. Kennedy. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. We have no proof one way or another. And both those, well, we never found Adolfo, but Stern turned out to be uh, an American uh, movie star. <clears throat> and uh, she's been dead for some years now, too, so. That, in my opinion, it's a dead end. And it's not important enough to dig into it real hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The um I I know in that hunting Hitler they allegedly went to oh, one of the nephews or nieces um to seek a DNA sample and she refused to give it of, of Ava Braun's family. <laughs> I don't blame her. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we want to we want to create all sorts of trouble for you. Do you want to help us? Give us a DNA sample so we can ruin your life. Yeah, hit yeah, the trail, yeah. buddy. Yeah, yeah. Especially when you know it's going to be a you know a major television series rather than just someone. It's, that's... it's a witch hunt. That's what it is. A witch hunt. You know, if you um if you go down there, if you're in Argentina today, is is there? There's no shortage of people. You could turn up even today, and obviously you'd be dealing with the grandchildren, but there's still no, you can keep scratching away at this. There's still that, this will be going on for years. We'll still be uncovering um, strands of evidence for years, do you believe? Yeah. Oh, definitely. There, There is so much down there yet to be discovered. 
it, this is a giant onion that we're peeling back there. You go to the flea markets and you can buy stuff with swastikas on them out on the street on the flea markets. Some of it may be reproduction, but there's books from the 1930s, 1940s that have the swastikas on them. Um, it, it's going to be an, an open book for a long time, I think, if people are interested in, in digging, which is what I am. Yeah. Unfortunately, um, I lost my angel. We had a, a, a guy named Jack Goodyear who was ultra wealthy. And he wanted to dig into this history, too, but he was in bad health and he couldn't go anywhere. So every so often I get a call. Hey, Harry, I heard about such and such down in uh, such and such Argentina. What do you know about that? Not a hell of a lot, Jack. Well, I want you to go down there and dig into it. Next thing I know, there's a five thousand dollar check in my mailbox and I'm down in Argentina. Wow. Uh, we had another angel, uh, a guy named uh, uh, Charlie Entenman, uh, now in Australia, that probably doesn't mean much, but Entenman's Bakeries is a huge corporation in the United States. Oh, okay. And so he'd, he'd kick 5,000, 8,000 this way and say, hey, go down and check this out. But unfortunately, both of those guys have passed on. Is, is there another trip planned? Have you got more, you know, that you, you, you're you sort of hoping to line up and head back for another tour to these places? Oh, absolutely. Um we put together history tours for our members. Any one of our members who wants to come along with us. We're going to Germany uh, the last week in September, first week in October. Unfortunately, we won't see any of the veterans because they're all gone. But we go places um, and some places that are not open to the public. Uh, you know, the, the the party rally grounds in Nuremberg. Everybody goes there. We go there to the big stadium. We go there. Everybody goes there. But around behind the stadium, there's a door with a sign that says Eingang Verboten. Most people think that means entry forbidden. We think it means shark hunters are welcome here. And it's exclusive. one of our members over there is a colonel in their army, and he's also the assistant to the mayor. And he's got all the keys. So we go in there. And the, the ceiling... In the, in the main entry room where they had uh, receptions, the golden swastikas are still in the ceiling, and they would have receptions there. And you go up a couple of flights of stairs, Hitler's office is still there. There's nothing in it, not even a wooden door jam. But then you go up even higher, and there's the door that only Hitler was allowed to use to come out to where he'd come out to all the people. So we go there. We go to, uh, there were tunnels and bunkers that we've discovered. <clears throat> that are now closed off, I'm told. We go down to our, uh, Austria and uh, places there and meeting with people there. They have uh, the the mountain is Oryx Mountain, Oryxberg. For decades and decades, they would have a ceremony on the first Sunday of October every year where they remembered everyone who fell in battle, no matter what uniform, no matter what flag, but, of course, the people like the Southern Poverty Law Center and others say, oh, it's an SS celebration. No, it ain't, for God's sake. I was there. I was not in the SS. A lot of Germans, Russians are there. So, but that's what we're doing. And, and people can send me an email, sharkhunters at sharkhunters.com. I'll give them all the information. And we're also in the process of putting together another return to Argentina. We'll spend about four days in Buenos Aires, go to the restaurant where Mengele and Eichmann used to have lunch. Food ain't all that good, but there's a lot of history. <laughs> uh, many other places around Buenos Aires that pertain to the Third Reich. Then we fly on down to Bariloche and we'll stay one night in the guest house at Enalco, Hitler's estate. We can't stay in the house because it's got no plumbing, no heat, no electric, and sadly, it's falling apart. Uh, it's for sale, but god awful amount of uh, 23 million euros, which is about 26 million US dollars, which would be probably 32 or so million wow. Oz dollars. Yeah. Is it's it got so, it's privately owned. hundreds of acres. 
Say again. So it's a, it's someone it's privately owned by someone, and they've just let it deteriorate yeah. to that point. Unfortunately, yeah, it's got five kilometers of shoreline on this beautiful lake. I mean, a thousand or so acres of property. But what are you going to do with it? It's fallen apart. It's out in the boondocks. You know, if we could have raised the money years ago when it was still in good shape, 2011, a Chilean uh, volcano named El Tronador, means the thunderer, blew a bunch of stuff in the sky and everything downwind, which was to the east, was covered with about two inches of volcanic ash, including that house. The beautiful lawn was destroyed. The house, if they'd have got out there and swept that stuff off the roof, they'd have been okay, but they just yeah. left it. And it's very acidic, and it just turned the place into a mess. But the, look, firstly, thank you extremely for your time and, and the books and the information that you're capturing and captured um, whether people choose to believe it or not, it's a fascinating story. And if, like I said, I, you know, I've tried to look at it on a level playing field and the, the evidence on one side just is so strong. It's hard to deny, you know, if, if any historian mainstream historian was to just be given this information and look at it, uh, without carrying the, the legacy, um, story, I guess you, you it's hard to dismiss it. So, and you've been a big right. uh, contributor to that. So, you know, I, I, I thank you for for all of what you've done in bringing that to light and bringing stories of others. And like you said, going there, talking to these people, not not uh, reciting from a history book or a newspaper. You know, you've done boots on the ground work, which is uh, it's it's invaluable to yeah. to the story. Boots on the ground is the only way to get the the true story. Otherwise, you're just copying what somebody else wrote. Yeah. Maybe it's correct. Maybe it's not correct. But unless you're there and you look the man in the face and you ask him questions, you take down his hand. I've, I've videotaped a lot of these and you just can't deny first person history. And a lot of the American guys I interviewed confirmed what the German guys were saying. So, so there's the cross relation too that, that you're, you're getting things line up and and that's what right. i found that's exactly the when and i'm only scratching the surface you know we're, we're only talking a, a short amount of time that i've been scratching away at this and it's it's just you know captivated me but um th that's what i mean it, it just there's lines of there's parallel there's crossover there's so many things that just keep bringing the fibers together um yeah and that's why it's hard to dismiss it i believe anyway yeah well you can't dismiss fact um they can paint all sorts of camouflage around it but if somebody wants to dig and get the actual truth it's there yeah. to be found and look it sounds like i mean i listened to one podcast um he had on a guest that he claimed to be the the authority the most you know well-researched world war ii hitler based and and it almost is like you hear him, his facts for the, their side of the events, you know, was, was pretty much, oh, it was built on statements and yeah, the statements might've varied, but that happens even in today's interviews. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was built on statements and it, and you sort of go, it feels like a kid or an adult telling a kid, well, we asked everyone, so don't talk about it anymore. That's, that's yeah. almost how it felt. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, some people, get that way and they don't want you to look any further just take my word for it and that's it but yeah you know, and i don't know why I'm, i i mean look in the back of my mind i keep i i just don't understand i i don't understand it is it you know i could understand if you were related to a family that was involved and you've got a sense of pride or a sense of shame or there's there's some underlying emotion that would cause you to act in that way that i understand but when i listen to these historians and it's like but hang on, your job is to research and, and tell a story. And if you're dismissing all of this evidence, all of these other stories, you're not even entertaining them. You're not even hearing them to then do your own research. That's either negligence or there's something else. And that something else is just bugging me. It's, I just, it's really, there's just something about it that doesn't sit right with me, the way that it's um, being dismissed and, and and like yeah. I said, it's like a parent telling a little kid, just stop talking about it, Johnny. You, you know, you're yeah. too young to know. Yeah, there. you say maybe there's something else. Yeah, there are several maybe something else. Some people want you to just 
listen to what they're saying by rote because it, it boosts their ego. Other peoples have an axe to grind because we want to keep the Germans uh, looking terrible monsters. And uh, every, everyone has their own reason. My reason is I'm telling the truth the way it happened. If you don't like it, tough shit. Yeah. But this is the way it was. Thank you so much, Harry. I've, I've really thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed spending time with you. Yeah, I've, I've had a, a very nice time, too. Thank you, Harry. All right. You have an awesome day. Thanks very much for sticking to the end of the show. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. It's certainly a topic that uh, that manages to keep you interested and is intriguing decades and decades after it is all said to have taken place. As spoken about in the show, there are a couple of uh, key subjects that I can list some links to. So if you are wanting to find out more, head over to bumpingintocomau Don't forget the .au because it's an Australian based podcasts uh, that's where you'll find the main website then once you're there look for the podcast episode page go onto that page and there will be a whole bunch of links i will list links to harry's um, shark hunters website i'll list links to his book to the hunting hitler documentary to the uh, gray wolf documentary i'll put there as much as i can for anyone that is interested to make it easy to keep digging deeper on this subject for yourself i do recommend watching those videos uh, and, and documentaries or movies once again as always Thank you very much for sticking to the end. Thank you very much for listening. I've said this before. You guys are spoiled for choice. There are so many podcasts out there. There is so much content available. So I genuinely appreciate every single stream, every single listener that takes the time to listen. Uh, If you do like the show, by all means, subscribe. If you like the episode, I would love a five-star review. Five-star reviews are the only ones that really count and help the show move further up the ranks so other people can find them. More importantly, if there's someone you think would enjoy it, please do share it with them. That's my primary concern is just, you know, share the show with someone you think would like it. And I will catch up with you on the next episode of Bumping Into. Thanks for stopping.